perhaps you'll have gleaned from the stories of the last weeks that they've been for the purpose of possibly allowing to arise in us an understanding of the laws of life that are put into motion when certain circumstances or situations are present. And this in an endeavor to allow us to answer the question, what is it that is enacted when stillness and movement meet? This we know is variously called the Tao or the Dharma or the will of God. But before telling a story that does have this aim, there is a way to demonstrate this, and it's again through the stories. Now, there's no doubt that you've heard these two little stories, but let's see what happens when we put them together. You'll remember that one about the two monks who are having a very heated argument about the ways to Nirvana. When the Master came along and they sought that he intercede to tell them who was right. So the first one propounded his beliefs saying that we have to go through the motions and act and have devotion and so forth and so on. And the Master turned to him and he said, you're right. Yes, yes, you're right. And then the second one propounded his beliefs, <coughs> which were totally different to the first monks, saying, no, 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 it's through good works, we must do good works and arms and dedicate ourselves in service. The Master turned to him and said, you're right. Yes, you're right. And then another monk who had happened to come by and had listened to this, said, but Master, they can't both be right. The Master turned to him and said, yes, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but then there were another two monks having a very similar heated argument. The Master comes along and they ask him to intercede and decide who it is that's correct. And the Master said, have you ever seen two dogs fighting over a bone? And of course they had. And he said, well, have you ever seen the bone getting into the argument? <laughs> <laughs> then there was a young man. He had no one, nobody. He had no parents, he had no mentor, he had no guru, he had no friends, he had no wife, he had no children, he had nothing. So he decided that he would go on a pilgrimage to Hasidera. Now Hasidera is the place where one of the greatest temples in honor of the goddess Canon is situated in Japan. So he set out on his pilgrimage, and when he came to this great temple, he laid himself in front of the altar and he said, I'm going to stay here until I die, because life is not worth living. I have nothing. I have no one. But the monks of that temple came along and they were very concerned because they didn't want someone dying in front of their altar. It wasn't a thing to do. So the monks came over to him and asked him what he was about and he explained that he had no one, he had nothing, that he was just going to stay here and give himself over to what Kenan wanted to do with him. And if he must die, he would die. Well, the monks wouldn't have that at all. And they decided that if he'd given himself over to Kenan, that uh, maybe they should feed him. And so this is what they did. They bought him food. They took it in turns to bring him food. But he stayed there. And he stayed there 
for three lots of seven days. And then on the morning of the 22nd day, a very strange thing happened to him. It seemed that he was asleep. Maybe he was dreaming. But from behind the altar came a being. And that being said to him, You've got a damn cheek coming here and presenting yourself to Canon when you know that it's your karma that has put you in these circumstances. But Canon is taking pity on you. Now, get yourself up from here and leave this place, but take with you whatever it is you find in your hand and do with it what you will. Well, the young man had been given his orders, hadn't he? So he got himself up from in front of the altar, taking his leave of the monks, and he set out on his way. But he only got as far as the temple gates when he fell over on his face. But when he got up, he had in his hand a wisp of straw. Well, he looked at the straw and he remembered what the being had said. Take with you what you find in your hand. He said he can't doubt what Canon has given him. So clutching his wisp of straw, he went off down the road. And he hadn't gone too far when one of those horseflies began to buzz around his face. And he picked up a branch to try to wave it away, but it wouldn't go. So he caught the horsefly, and he tied it with his wisp of straw around its middle, and put it on the branch, and carried it out in front of him as he walked around along the road. <laughs> And the horsefly was just buzzing around like he was guiding him along the way, kind of. But then there was a carriage coming the other way. And in it there were a group of women, obviously on their way to some kind of pilgrimage or service or temple or shrine. And in the carriage was a little boy. And when he looked out and he saw the young man, he said to the women, I want, get, get, get me that, I, I, I want that, that that man's got. So the women sent a servant over to the young man asking, could they have this horsefly? Well, the young man looked at his branch, his wisp of straw and his horsefly and he said, well, Cannon gave this to me, but if the young man wants it, he can have it. So he handed over the branch with the buzzing horse fly and the whisper straw. Well, when the women in the carriage saw this, they said, oh, what an act of kindness. And they sent back with the servants to the young man three mandarin oranges wrapped very beautifully in Japanese paper. So the young man took them and said, well, my wisp of straw has turned into three mandarins. And he took them along with him as he proceeded along the road. But he hadn't gone too much further when a group approached him. And in the midst of that group, there was a woman in dressed in great finery, but she was staggering. She was obviously on a mission of some kind to a temple or a shrine, but she was visibly exhausted, her legs going from under her, and she was crying for water to those servants who were around her. But the servants were looking for the carriage that had the supplies 
and it wasn't to be seen. And just at that moment, the woman fainted on the road from exhaustion and thirst. And the servants flustered around, not, not, not knowing what to do. But then they saw the young man and they said to him, You must know where water is. The young man said, Well, it's quite a distance from here. If there's not any close by. Oh, what are we to do? said the servants. And the young man took his three mandarin oranges and he said, oh, Please give these to your mistress. So in that fainted state, the juice from these mandarin oranges was fed to the mistress. And she revived and she said, what, what happened? I know that I was thirsty. And the servants related the story of how the young man had given his mandarin oranges. She was very, very grateful. And she called the young man over to her. And by this time, the carriage with the supplies had arrived. So they set up a little camp. And the woman insisted that the young man be fed and fated in thanks. But this is not enough, she said. This is not enough. And the young man was sitting there thinking, well, my wisp of straw became three mandarins. I wonder what my three mandarins are going to become. But after he'd been fed and fated, the mistress sent off to her carriage, and out were bought three bolts of very fine white linen. Well, the young man accepted these and tucked them under his arm as he took his leave and went on his way. Now, again, as he walked down the road, coming towards him, he saw a man on a most magnificent horse. But <clears throat> as the horse and rider came close to him, the horse's legs buckled from under it, it fell to the ground and was visibly dying. Well, the rider was in a terrible state of despair. What would he do, his wonderful horse? <clears throat> he did have a group of servants with him, so of course there were other horses to ride. But this magnificent creature was one that he'd specially chosen. And here it was, before his very eyes, dying. Well, the horse did expire, and the young man, being on a mission himself, set off on another horse, leaving a servant to dispose of the carcass of the beautiful creature. Well, the servant didn't know what to do. He was standing there talking to the young man and he said, well, you know, I, I would like to take the pelt of this horse, but I can't carry it. What am I to do? And the young man said, why don't you leave it to me? And with that, he offered the servant one of his bolts of beautiful white linen which the servant very gladly accepted and went running off before the young man changed his mind. Well, the young man was standing there thinking, my wisp of straw turned into three mandarins and now my mandarins have turned into a horse. I wonder what's going to happen now. And with that, the horse gave a couple of snorts, came back to life, stood quavering a little bit, but then was quite healthy and ready to ride. So the young man went ahead leading the horse, and the next place he came to 
he swapped another bolt of cloth for an old saddle and a bridle, which he put on the horse so he was able to ride. Well, he went on and by this time it was well into evening, so he stopped at an inn for repose and refreshment and he swapped the last bolt of cloth for his lodging. The next morning he got up and got on his magnificent steed and set off towards what could clearly be seen in the distance as a rather large city. But as he approached the city he thought to himself, oh, maybe if I take this magnificent horse into this place they will recognize it and think that I've stolen it. What can I do? And just at that moment, because he was on the outskirts of the city, he happened to notice that there was a young man, obviously in great haste, making preparations to depart somewhere. Oh, said thought the young man, maybe he could do with a horse. So he went over to this abode and he asked the man, oh, could he do it well when the young traveller saw this magnificent creature. He said, oh yes, oh yes. He said, but I really haven't got anything transportable that I can give you in exchange. I can give you some land, rice land. Well, the young man thought about this. He said, well, you know, I'm a traveller too and I really have no great use for a piece of land, but, 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 you know, uh, I, I, I'll swap it with you. So the trade was made. The young man took the horse and he offered rice and a tract of rice land. And he, he said, look, he said, you can live in my house. He said, uh, stay there and, and if I don't come back, he said, you can have it because I don't have anyone to leave it to, so no one will come and try to take it away from you. Yeah, make use of the house. So off went the traveller. Young man settled in this abode. And because it was time for planting, he rented out half of the land and planted half of it himself, which prospered wonderfully. I don't think I have to tell you the rest of the story, but I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> it, it blossomed, and more land came to him, and more land came to him, and he had servants, and he had helpers, and it's said that his family is still prospering today. What is this story? but to do with the putting into motion the laws of life that are enacted when certain circumstances are present, such as giving devotion, being focused. But I don't have to say any more about that. Because we experience this for ourselves. What it is that happens when we have purpose. And that brings up a very funny story, although one doesn't want to make this a prolonged thing. But yesterday, someone came to interview me for a profile in the local newspaper. And after spending an hour and a half together, he was totally bamboozled <laughs> because he said, I don't believe you. I don't believe you have no purpose. You cannot live without purpose. He said, well, I won't recount what had been enumerated in the lifetime, but this was the picture that he got. He said, no. So he went off shaking his head. I don't know what kind of 
Vatican's going to go in. <laughs> <laughs> but that goes against what's being asked, isn't it? Because here we are talking about laws that enact a purpose, and here we are with that purpose. I was a, might have done myself out of a job, I think. Anyway, you figure it out. <coughs> but before we go and have our cup of tea, would you please uh, share it with us and allow us to share with you what it is that's... Could we all please just, <coughs> in a short prayer, say sorry for the waters of Fukushima and give and send love and gratitude indeed for all waters of the earth. Very short, just now. 